Hello and welcome to this special show, Oil and Gas 2.0. I am Gautam Srinivasan. With rising demand for petroleum and increasing crude oil prices, how can India firm up its policies to sustain growth? What is holding back India's hydrocarbon potential? And what can be done to boost investments in this sector? Is India's fiscal policy framework competitive enough for exploration as well as upstream? Well, lots of questions to answer on this show. We will discuss how India can unleash its true potential for oil and gas. And joining me is an esteemed panel of corporate voices, energy experts and policy makers to help us all understand the challenges and of course crafting a strategy to overcome these. Let me quickly introduce you to the panelists. I have with me energy expert Dr. Bhami Shinoy and former Petroleum Secretary Vivek Ray in the studio. We also have with us Mr. P. Elango, Managing Director, Hindustan Oil Exploration Company from Chennai, Sudhir Mathur, CEO, Vedanta Kane Oil and Gas from Jaipur, and R. P. Gupta, Additional Secretary of Energy at the Niti Aayog, joining us from New Delhi. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. It's a very pertinent question. There's always potential, but when it comes to delivery, there is always a lacune. In fact, if you look at the recent OAL rounds, I'm going to take start the discussion with that as a case study. You had 55 blocks, 110 bids, but just about nine players doing all the bidding. So my first question to you, Mr. Ray, is you know how can India enhance its stake in this investment pie, especially when the world over folks are working with lower exploration budgets? Well, that's a tough uh, one to solve because we've been trying to uh, enhance our exploration potential but have not really succeeded. Mm. And uh, I think in the last uh, three years, some fundamental steps have been taken and some uh, foundations have been laid. And uh, I think the important thing is to get the policies right, mm. the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in place, mm. and then hope that we can uh, move on from there. Okay. The most important uh, thing that has happened in the last three, four years is the setting of the national data repository. Mm. Because that really brings together all the exploration data generated over the last 70 odd years, mm. and private sector and public sector. It also encourages companies to go in for exploration. And once you have this data, in place, then companies can come and look at different blocks and look at the potentiality and then begin to make selections. Okay. So I think the most important foundation for uh, launching uh, an energizing exploration has been the National Data Repository, hmm. which was a major, major missing link in the policy framework. All right, let me go to Mr. Elango. Uh, Mr. Elango, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, you know, what can, what in your opinion can India do to kind of stem this decline in production and raise production capacity? Uh, I think for, first of all, for India to really understand the changed global context, uh, and to my mind, the changed global context is one of the important factors. Uh, it's become difficult to predict the demand for oil in a long-term sense, hmm. uh, which means while everybody agrees that the oil demand will grow between now and 2020, between 2020 to 2040, what is going to happen to the oil demand is a big question mark. Uh, there are predictions that it will uh, fall, there are predictions that it will grow, there are predictions that it will flatten over this next two decades starting from 2020 to 2040. Now, in that context, uh, when you look at the major uh, oil, gas and companies, what has been their strategy is to uh, more focused on monetizing the existing reserves rather than focusing of getting into a new country and finding new hydrocarbon resources. That's a reality. Now, taking this reality into account, mm. the government of India need to reposition its value proposition. Uh, or restructure its value proposition. It has done the right thing by, as Mr. Ray said, uh, launching the NDR and launching the first uh, uh, hydrocarbon exploration licensing policy round, uh, which means the doors have been kept open on a 365 day basis for the global industry to come in. But more need to be done and okay. we'll come to that in the, maybe the next round. Absolutely, and that's the broad prescription from policy and industry. But let me focus again on, on the, the recent OAL rounds. And Vedanta has, uh, I believe, Mr. Mathur, bid for all 55 blocks. Why, why so much interest? Could you, could you clarify the position there? I'd like to start off by saying that I must compliment, uh, you know, Honorable Mr. Minister Pradhan and the DGH, Mr. Chakravarti, for unleashing 
you know, this whole exploration round in a manner that our country has never seen before. Hmm. So, you know, uh, as Mr. Ray said, you know, the data is available on the na national depository. It's open 24 into 7 and it gives a uh, huge comfort to any potential bid bidder. Uh, the second point is really, you know, uh, you know, if you look at our uh, group chairman, uh, Mr. Agarwal and, uh, and the founder, he's a man of extraordinary vision and passion. And he believes that uh, he's in pursuit of eradication of poverty in India mm. uh, and, fi and, you, and finds uh, value to be in the natural resources business to make it happen. Third, I would like to say it's a management team which uh, has worked wonderfully uh, when crude prices hit $30 mm. uh, to create a set of opportunities. Uh, you know, we are blessed to have this team. We've got great geologists uh, and explorationists with us. Okay. So combining all these three things, we've set ourselves a vision of being wanting to be 50% of India's oil production mm. in the medium term. And we felt this was the biggest opportunity that was in front of us. All right. So that's what put us, uh, you know, we bid for all the 55 blocks, uh, you know, and, uh, and we believe that we can deliver upon this to increase our production substantially in the medium term. All right, they're bullish on their prospects. Dr. Shana, you, you, you work with international majors like Chevron in your, in, your, yeah. in, your, in your previous experience. How do they view the India story, especially when it comes to production? And as I mentioned, we are staring at a huge import bill and lower production, and where we need a more broad-based ecosystem of players operating to raise production levels. How do foreign players view the India story? I would like to bring that. I'm glad that you are asking me this question. I would like to differ a little bit with the earlier speakers. Mm that uh, putting the data on that is not, to me, a great thing. Okay. Because I know from, for a fact, many of these uh, major oil companies, they already know what is there in India and all over the world. Mm. Uh, and this is the fact, not just a uh, few years back, 30, 40 years back. So that's not a, really a big thing. What is really required is for government of India to tell, we are going to hold the contract sacred. Mm. What has happened is that the oil companies do not believe that whatever signed over here, they hold it sacred. Mm. So that is why somehow or other we have to create that impression that uh, India really is going to comply with whatever. All right, let me go back to the policy experts. Mr. Gupta, FI 2018 saw six straight year of consecutive declines when it came to production. Now, what can be done in your opinion to stem this production decline? See, government has already taken a number of steps particularly making the policy more market friendly and pricing freedom has been given now. So it is expected that price now, the, this oil production would increase. As you know, this oil and gas production and exploration activities, they are long term activities. So results of these are likely to be seen in the near future. Unfortunately, the, the policies so far has been quite restrictive. And that probably led to a situation where the production, the new fields could not be come, could not come onto the production, mm. and it has led to the production fall. But with the policies which have been now kicked in, they are likely to result into a increased production in near future. Okay, but I have a follow-up question to you. The Honourable Prime Minister in 2015 laid out a vision of reducing uh, the import dependence from 77% to 67%. But after 2015, India's dependence on imports has actually increased. So in your opinion, what are the measures needed to meet the Prime Minister's vision? See, we have to give the companies <coughs> the marketing and pricing freedom. That is the first thing which is necessary for... Uh, encouraging the investment in the f in, in wild fields and increasing the production. And these policies have now been put in place and they are, or whichever, whatever is lacking now, that has been, they are, they are coming into operations. As you know, Prime Minister held two meetings with the global oil experts and their suggestions we are taken and their suggestions we are examined and they are now, have been converted into the policy documents and policies have been uh, brought out. The recently, DGH, they went for auction of about 50 fields and they will soon be allotted. Now, these are all the measures taken for uh, reducing our import dependence. Okay. Mr. Ray, 
so we've heard lots of factors. We've heard regulatory hurdles, we've heard contract sanctity, we've heard policy flip-flops. What is going to happen in addressing these measures? Because these are not new points which are being raised. These are points which have been raised by private industry players and also whispered about in policy circles. What do you think finally needs to happen to, 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 to address this triumvirate of issues so that India can actually kickstart its exploration policy? Well, you know, contract sanctity is uh, something which uh, you cannot predict uh, in, a, in a democracy where pa parties change power every five years. And look at what has happened to the contract sanctity with the Iran nuclear deal. So, to give a contract sanctity for a 30-year th period or a 50-year period, uh, saying that the terms and conditions will not change, is, is a commitment that nobody can actually make. You can, you can strive for it if there is general consensus that the objective is clear and we need to energize uh, exploration and production, and then hopefully everybody will stick to the terms of the contract. I think uh, one of the missing pieces is the gas pricing policy. And uh, what we now call pricing freedom is actually capped by, uh, by a complicated formula which has various uh, variants on uh, different alternative fuels. Hmm. And uh, if we really want to give pricing freedom, then that cap should go. Okay, that's and, an important and, point. And there. also, I think uh, that when we when we announce a pricing policy, okay, what is the time frame we keep in mind? We shouldn't be keeping in mind the time frame of two, three years. We'll see later on. We will change it again hmm. because contracts are getting awarded. Look at an immediate time frame, and of course, pricing no, you, caps. You need look at to a go. long term time frame. So when you okay. appoint, announce a pricing policy, you know, an exploration period may be seven, eight years. A development phase may be another 15, 20 years. Okay, we'll production. continue on those points. We'll continue on so those points, years, Mr. Ray. Pricing yes. policy should be stable for a 20-year time frame. All right, we'll continue on those points, but we need to take a short break right now. But do stay tuned. Lots more points to discuss on this special presentation. Welcome back to this special presentation, Oil and Gas 2.0. In the previous segment, Mr. Ray had just uh, commented on what are the policy prescriptions, what the government, of course, needs to do in order to enhance exploration. Let me get a private uh, sector voice on this as well. Mr. Mathur, what are the three things the government needs to do, in your opinion, to develop exploration and production in the country? Well, I, you know, I would agree with, uh, you know, the comment made on contract sanctity, mm. totally. I think that's the most important thing. It's the foundation of the investment is a contract and uh, you know if policy is going to override contract you know one can really you know forget investments whether they come from offshore or onshore okay. uh, you know because it's uh, oil and gas is a extremely extremely risky business one the exploration itself to the commodity cycle and it's uh, on top of it it's a very very capital intensive uh, business so, you know, we cannot be exposed on all fronts. I mean, every company looks at surface and subsurface risks there. And if, sub, sub, uh, su you know, surface risk, which is policy, is going to be so, is, is a very dominating factor in that decision making. So, uh, you know, investments are an outcome of uh, open, transparent, uh, and, and, uh, and, and a, a, a regime like that. Hmm. I think that's one, and I think marketing freedom uh, pricing freedom is something that's there. Uh, uh, you know, recently there has been G issues around GST, mm. and we believe that they should certainly be part of GST. I mean, uh, you know, when, when we look at imports of crude, uh, you know, it's, it comes without any duty, but local producers, there are taxes on top of that. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, we have to find a regime that allows us uh, to make investments on a sustainable manner in the industry. Okay. You know, so contracts are important. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to add to that, I think that what's also important is, uh, you know, we fully understand, everybody understands that the government is the custodian of resources of, uh, on behalf of citizens of the country. But a judicious mix of government take hmm. versus how much a producer should invest to make sure that, you know, crude production, especially in a country like India, which imports, you know, over 80% of its crude, mm. uh, find that balance. I mean, what's the point of importing crude at 60, 70, 80, 90, mm. when there is oil in the country, 
the government gets a substantial part of it, creates more jobs. Mm. So why are we exporting jobs uh, is really a question. And what is the fine balance okay. uh, in the two? Okay. Clearly, the production has fallen over the last five, seven years. So it's time for the government to intro introspect on that itself. Understood, Mr. Mathur. Mr. Elango, you have something to add to this, uh, This, you know, what the government needs to do, three things the government, in your opinion, that needs to do in order to develop uh, exploration and production in the country. Yeah, three things are, the first is to really focus on gas mm. and help the country to move from an oil-based economy to a gas-based economy. Mm. Uh, in the global uh, uh, average mix of gas and global energy is about 24 percent, whereas in India it is about 7 8 percent. So there's a huge scope for improving the uh, share of gas in the primary energy mix of India, number one. Mm. Number two is to really focus on the northeast region in India where there is a huge unutilized or untapped potential. I've had a personal experience of you know, building projects in the uh, Northeast which clearly show there is a lot to discover, there is a lot to develop there. And it's very interesting development that more private players are now coming into Northeast. And third and finally is to focus on the enhanced oil recovery uh, uh, for which the government is under, uh, under the process of bringing out a new policy. I'm sure a very focused UR incentive policy would help to recover more from some of the aging oil and gas fields in India. Okay. Through this, we should be able to clock a higher production rate. All right, let me come to Mr. Gupta. Uh, Mr. Gupta, Niti Ayog was drafting a national energy policy. When can we see that? When can we expect that? I will not give any date or will not give any particular time frame because it depends, it has to be cleared at a number of levels. Hmm. But we can expect it very soon. Okay. And an another issue is the upstream oil and gas sector lacks a regulator. You know, do you think a regulator would, would bring in uh, accountability to this? Do you think that's a prescription we also need to look at? Oil and gas sector already has two regulators. Director General of Hydrocarbon for Upstream and uh, Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board for Downstream and Marketing Sector. Hmm. So probably there is some thinking uh, in the government to have a joint regulator. But that is only at a conceptual stage only currently. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ray, you've heard, uh, you know, the private sector list the, you know, things the government needs to do. You've given your own perspectives. So what would be your reaction to whatever everyone has said? How much of it is feasible? How much of it is not feasible? You know, somewhere we also need to look at government priorities and whether they have misplaced or not. What's your view on this? Well, I think, you know, the, uh, the fact that uh, India is continuing to be dependent on oil is, is a given. Mm. And by 2040, despite uh, Mr. Alango saying there's a lot of uncertainty, all the projections suggest that our dependency is going to increase to 90 percent mm. from 80 uh, percent in terms of uh, the import of oil and probably gas. Mm. I also would like to endorse what Mr. Alango says about uh, gas, you know, this hydrocarbon exploration and licensing policy help is more about gas than oil. Because the potential in India, according to the data that's available, is much more for gas than for oil. Mm. So we really need to uh, look at how we can energize the exploration and production of gas rather than oil. That's okay. the expectation. And, and also then how do you mainstream gas into the uh, economy? Okay. And how do you increase the share of gas in the primary energy basket? Okay. That is a huge challenge. But that is something that takes us far beyond exploration and production into the gas economy and the uh, regulatory frame, framework, the gas all allocation policy and so on. Final question to you, uh, Dr. Shina. You know, what can India learn from, say, Brazil or Mexico? You mentioned a few yeah. examples earlier. What can India finally do in terms of learning from international best practices to develop its, uh, its domestic production capacity? 20 seconds. Okay. The first thing is that they should totally liberalize the gas market. Okay. There is no point of trying to tell the gas industry where, what should be the price. They have got a very irrational price based on markets which have no relevance to India. Hmm. The second also, the gas policy uh, in terms of where the gas should be used, it need not be, it should be de decided by the industry itself. Okay. And that is what is done all over the world. Okay. The third, in terms of uh, trying to, this uh, uh, contract sanctity. You need to maintain contract sanctity. You know, That's because, an important uh, point. The, you know, Mr. Ray mentioned that uh, in a democratic setup, it is not uh, possible. Okay. But when the oil industry is investing over 25 all right, years. All right, all right. Yeah.
point taken, sir. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap up the discussion. Lots more points, of course, to discuss, but it's been a, it's been an interesting exchange of thoughts from the different panelists here on very important topics regarding the oil and gas sector. Thank you to all of you for joining us for the discussion. And of course, thank you to the viewers for tuning in to this special presentation titled Oil and Gas 2.0. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.